Welcome to Let's Hear It. Let's Hear It is a podcast for and about the field of foundation and nonprofit communications, produced by its two co hosts, Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. No relation. Well said, Eric. And I'm Kirk. And I'm Eric. The podcast is sponsored by the Communications Network and the Lumina Foundation. We're talking to people about their work and what's happening in the field with the hopes of making this growing arena just a little bit more accessible to us all. You can find Let's Hear It on any podcast subscription platform. You can find us on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast. And you can email us at hello at Let's Hear It Cast dot com. Let us know if you have any thoughts about what you hear today, including people we should have on the show. And if you like the show, please, please, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find us. So let's get on to the show. And welcome once again to another edition of Let's Hear It. We're so happy to have you with us. We're so pleased to be sharing with you this another wonderful conversation led by Mr. Eric Brown. And uh, Eric, how are you? Good to see you. And what are we in for this week? We are in for some stuff. Actually, hey, Kirk, <laughs> how are you? How, how are things? I'm just fine. Thanks. Things are good. I think we're turning a corner in many respects, which is a happy thing. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm glad life. to turn a corner. People getting vaccinated, hopefully health returning, you know, cause going, in person. Because going down this, this straight line, straight to hell, isn't isn't cutting it for me. <laughs> That's right. I'm willing to turn a corner. I don't care where the turn where the corner leads. <laughs> That's just right. for the record. We just need it off ramp. So what's <laughs> happening this week? I can't wait to talk about this conversation that's ahead. It's so awesome. All right. So almost everything I've learned about presenting, storytelling, running a meeting, and now as it turns out, doing a online meeting, usually mm. through Zoom, but people use other tools, I learned from this guy named Andy Goodman. And yes. I've known Andy for a very, very, very long time since I was in knee pants. When I got started in communications, Andy was there helping folks like me figure out how to do it better. And he now has this report out, a resource, a thing, whatever you want to call it, called Unmuted, What Works, What Doesn't, and How We Can All Do Better When Working Together Online. And I say, <laughs> meh, who needs that? Yeah, right. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, we're not spending well, we any think... time online, are we, Kirk? <laughs> yeah, that's right. As a, well, you and I were sitting virtual? here in a room together, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Never felt closer. Never felt closer to you. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, I could reach out and touch you if you weren't so far away. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, so, yeah. So, Andy, Andy is a communications guru. He is yeah. trained... Uh, I don't know, hundreds upon hundreds of organizations about how to communicate, how to tell stories, how to present. His book, Why Bad Presentations Happen to Good Causes, is probably one of the greatest things that ever happened <laughs> to the world of presentations uh, that I can imagine. So when Andy came out with this report about how to work together online, I thought, that, well, like, okay, that's something useful. And so, so we have this conversation. What, what else do you want to know before we go to the conversation? There it is. It's Andy Goodman from the Goodman Center, uh, where do-gooders learn to do better. Let's listen to Andy, and then we'll come back and we'll talk more. Andy Goodman on Let's Hear It. Welcome to Let's Hear It. My guest today is none other than Andy Goodman, the co-founder and director of the Goodman Center. But also, I would like to say that, Andy, you are the Swiss Army Knife. Of, of helping people with communications because you do so much storytelling, presenting, strategy, I don't know, probably a million other things. Andy, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I've never been called a Swiss Army knife before. Well, now you, now you have. We're talking today about this report that you have that has just come out called Unmuted, What Works, What Doesn't, and How We Can All Do Better When Working Together Online. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, more people are working online than they used to. That is true, more than ever. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that because it's really important. You, you have nothing in here about chiropractic, but uh, we are all bent <laughs> over and we've been staring at screens uh, since March and maybe even a little bit before. So there's lots to talk about. But before we get to that, Andy, I just for the nine people out there in our field who are not familiar with you, I just wanted to talk a little bit about 
who you are and how you got here, because uh, I think that working on the nanny really does qualify you for everything. So can you just oh, t- you could, give us a little bit of your background? Dinosaurs. <laughs> are you there? So, I was going to say dinosaurs? Yeah. That, well, that, that was, too. That, that's my, my the other credit. A lot of people know that show more than the. Well, actually, I guess people know the nanny and the and dinosaurs. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so my background is all in media and communications. I worked in the television business, as you just indicated. I was a writer on the nanny on CBS for uh, three episodes. I didn't last very long there. Uh-huh. Uh, and on dinosaurs for three seasons. Before that, I worked in radio, and before that, I worked in advertising. So my whole background, my deep background is all in, in sort of media and communications and storytelling. But in, uh, in 1998, I chucked it all uh, so I could have my own firm just to help nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, you know, good causes writ large, communicate more effectively, primarily through storytelling. We started in May 1998, and we've been doing it now for 22 years. And uh, you didn't last long in the nanny because you had a hard time tra- channeling your inner friend, Drescher? Yeah, <laughs> so. I think uh, um, Fran Drescher. Fran Drescher was my experience of life is too short. <laughs> uh, and uh, and dinosaurs. Now uh, the high irony is that uh, here we are, you and me, a couple of dinosaurs talking about <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. Dinosaurs, by the way, now available on Disney Plus. Excellent. I'm going to sign up now. Because uh, Hamilton wasn't good enough, but now that I get to see Andy Goodman's work, that's <laughs> a good good dinosaurs. You can, it's worth it now. I, it's totally worth it. So it's obviously not a, a huge leap to go from storytelling in one medium to storytelling in another. But on the other hand, sometimes you talk to people and they say, "I don't have the first idea about what the nonprofit community does or what social causes really are or how I would go about that." What did, what was your path to that? Well, I, I actually skipped a step because after I left the TV business, I went to run a nonprofit for five years uh, called the Environmental Media Association, which was started by Norman Lear and some of his friends to be the the nexus, the connecting point between the environmental community with all the important messages it has to get out and the entertainment industry with its huge megaphone for getting out messages. And what we did at, at Emma was to work with writers and producers of TV shows and movies, trying to convince them to put environmental messages into their storylines. So there was that five-year transition of running that organization with one foot in the nonprofit world, one foot in the entertainment world. And the foot in the nonprofit world felt better to me. I thought, here's where all the good people are. But what I was was, uh, recognizing was that these good people um, were you know, well-versed in their fields, were uh, deeply passionate and committed to what they did, but not very good at talking about it, and particularly not good at telling stories. So after five years of running Emma, I started my own firm to, to help nonprofits and other good causes tell stories more effectively, uh, to have more impact with the people they wanted to reach. And one of the early, I, re, I remember one of the early publications you put out, you're getting, this is quite the cottage industry for you, uh, but the, one of the early ones was called Why Bad Ads happened to good causes. And uh, that that was back in the day when people actually took out print ads in public. Yeah, that was back in, <laughs> yeah, that, that we published that in 2004. Uh, so not, I mean, on one hand, you're not that long ago, but it is 16 years. Um, and at the time, there, there was a lot of print advertising going on in the nonprofit or public interest world. And a lot of it wasn't effective. A lot of it wasn't working. And a lot of the nonprofits who were doing these ads had no idea it wasn't working until uh, there was a study done by Roper Starch that that actually you know graded these ads on effectiveness and found that people weren't reading them, weren't remembering them, et cetera. And so we took a whole bunch of these ads and uh, put them together in this book and said, you know, here are some of the mistakes people are making. Let's let's learn from our mistakes and do better next time. And this is a, sort of a theme of of your work. You've you've taken some of these kind of I don't know what you want to call them tent pole communications tools and and helped us all learn about how to do a better job at at delivering on those things. So after that, you did why bad presentations happen to good causes. And I'm you know I certainly see, I see this you know real connection between the report that you've just put out and that one because I think we all can agree that most presentations that we see could be better. 
Can you just talk about how, how you, you went from bad ads to bad presentations? Yeah, it's kind of funny. It's, it's a natural progression. Um, after I did uh, the bad ads book, I kind of went out in the circuit to talk a lot about it and to present our findings, which put me at a lot of conferences. Uh, and when you attend conferences, you wait your turn to present and you watch other people. So for a number of years, I was kind of out there on the road, presenting, doing workshops, watching other presentations and thinking to myself, you know, oh my God, these are mind numbingly awful. And, uh, and that seems to be the, the sentiment of the room. Most people were, you know, Googling if there was internet access or doodling if they had a piece of paper or they were just outright nodding. And so I thought, well, maybe that's, maybe that's a subject for the next book. Maybe we should look into all these presentations. And so, so that's what we did. And we did our own research on that one where we surveyed people and asked them to talk about presentations, what they were seeing, what they were liking, what was making them run from the room screaming. And for that book, we got uh, 2,501 full-time public interest professionals from across North America to, to talk to us about presentations. And, and the book basically says, look, this is what the audience likes and this is what they don't like. You know, ignore it at your peril. I have to say that, that present your presentation on presentations, which I have now seen 40 times probably. Uh, yes, too many times. <laughs> Because I, I used to hire you to give that presentation to our grantees when I was yes, at you Hewitt, uh, among other places. Uh, it, it had such an effect on me. I mean, I still I have my my well leaf copy within within uh, uh, arm's reach of of my desk uh, because I continue to re respond to it. I, g I go back to it, and it's just had a big effect on me because it has helped me better understand how to communicate with whoever it is I'm trying to communicate with and whether that's in a presentation or not many of the principles that you you talk about in that book absolutely hold true and I, and when we get to the second half of this this uh, conversation we'll talk about your report on on online meetings but I really see so many similarities there can you just go back and and give our listeners a sense of what your kind of the main themes of of the bad presentations book were Sure. You know, what we talked about in the book is we're talking about the phenomenon, which we don't have these days, of in-person presentations. <laughs> Somebody at the front of the room, you know, usually with PowerPoint over their shoulder, talking for 20, 30, 40 minutes, showing slides, taking questions, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, what we found was that we asked people, what are the, what are the things people do that drive you crazy? And um, we came up with a list of five things that became what we called the fatal five, such as number one, the presenter reading the slides to the audience. That was the number right. one most common complaint. Uh, number two was too long or too much information into too little time. Call it what you will. It's just information overload. It's the presenter saying, here's everything I know about the subject. You figure it out. The third most common complaint was lack of interaction, that people are not there as vessels to be filled up with your information. They have questions. They want to work with it. They want to talk about it, et cetera. Insufficient interaction, insufficient engagement of the audience. The fourth problem was lack of enthusiasm or energy from the front of the room. You know, people droning on and on in monotone, you know, just hoping that the information will rise above their delivery. And the fifth problem, which has now completely gone away, was room and tech problems. You know, people <laughs> saying the room was too cold, the room was too hot. Uh, you know, there was a, I couldn't see the screen from where I was sitting. Just people physically uncomfortable, not ready to participate. So those are the things, those are the, the problems that we surfaced. And on the other hand, the things that we surfaced that people want, number one, but basically the inverse of what we just said, interaction. Number one is interaction. People want to be engaged. They want to participate. The second was, God, what was the second now that I'm thinking about it? Oh, clarity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that they, that they, there's a clear thesis supported by clear arguments and a clear resolution or conclusion or call to action. And then the third thing was enthusiasm, that the, the speaker, the presenter uh, seems genuinely excited about the material. And, and that becomes infectious, uh, a phrase that we use guardedly these days, uh -huh. and that people get caught up in the enthusiasm. So the report really helped us understand what people hate and what people want, and everything that followed was how do you give that to them. And you give a great presentation on these presentations. You you walk the talk, I guess you would, you could Thank say. You. Um, and so, and my question is, 
I mean, it's it's hard to to learn on a dime. Uh, and and I, like I said, I've seen your presentation so many times that it eventually sinks into my my the lipids or or whatever. How are you getting people to take this up? And and I will also just say that I think that presentations are getting somewhat better, but needless to say, we might have a little ways to go still. But yeah. how are you connecting with audience and getting them to actually take what it is you're recommending to them and put it into action? You know, it, it, it is hard. It, it's it's you know turning around that the great oil tanker that's moving in one direction and is sailing in a sea of maple syrup. You know, how do you basically <laughs> turn turn that ship around? It starts it starts a little bit with education. So if I get if I get to do a workshop with a group of people and I get two hours of their time, what I tell them right up front is I'm not going to change everything you do in these two hours, but hopefully I can give you enough that when I hand you this book to read with which has a lot more, you're actually going to want to read it. So the workshop is the is sort of the, the tip of the spear that hopefully, you know, pierces their consciousness and gets them to think, okay, there is a better way. And then the book gives them that. And then it's really up to them or their organization. You know, a lot of changing present presentations is culture change, right. getting organizations to say, okay, we, we can't be satisfied anymore with these text heavy, dense slides that nobody's reading, et cetera. Even if that's what everyone else is doing, we're going to rise above and do it. So all I hope to do is to pierce their consciousness, uh, foster culture change, and then leave it to the organizations to take it from there. Because it, it, it's, it's like anything else. It's like developing a new muscle. You got to do it again and again and again before you're going to really stick with it. And, and I just want to very briefly touch on your work on storytelling, because it's another thing that I have learned so much about, about how to tell a story from you. Um, and how do these things go together? How do you find that you're able to incorporate storytelling into presentations and other work? But can you also give us just the, like the 10 cent tour of how you help people tell stories? Well, well, yeah, you know, what I discovered early on is that when I would start to work with clients, you know, they would call and say almost the same thing every time. They'd say, we're really good at what we do. We're, we're just not so good at talking about it. And so I would say to them, okay, fine. I, I'd like to get to know you like anybody else. So tell me, tell me your favorite story. Tell me your favorite success story that really helps me understand who you are, what you do, you know, why you matter. And I would be talking to the executive director of the organization or a board member, the chair, and they would say, oh, a story. Um, uh, let, me call, uh, let me call Michelle in development because she's got all those great stories. And I'd be like, are you kidding? <laughs> you know, you're, the, you're the executive director. You're the ambassador of the organization. And you don't have these stories at your fingertips? So that's when I realized early on uh, there's a problem here. We're, we're, we're missing something. And so I started to work with clients and I'd say, you know, before we do anything else, Let's collect your stories. Let's gather the stories you have to tell, because I know they're out there, and let's, get, let's start working on telling them and, and telling them in an interesting fashion. You know, the, the journalistic way of telling stories like we see in newspapers, radio, TV, where you tell people right away, this is what happened. This is how it happened. This is why it happened. You know, that's good if you just want to inform people. But if you want to move people, you want to engage people, then you tell stories in a different way. You tell stories that have a beginning, middle, and end and you save the ending for the ending so that there's a little bit of drama to it. There's a little bit of emotion. There's a payoff. So teaching organizations to tell stories in this form of, you know, dramatic narrative, you know, the three act structure has been, that's been the main work of, of my firm for the last 20 years. It's funny because you, you talk about overcoming obstacles. So you, what, what yeah. do you say? Um, act one, you get the hero up a tree. Act two, you throw rocks at him. And act three, you got him down. Exactly. Uh, and so you and the th throwing rocks at your hero part is an obstacle that you overcome. But then you learn something and you go on to something else and there's another obstacle and you overcome that and so on. And I was when I was watching The Revenant, I thought about you because poor Leo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> like it was like it was like Andy oh Goodman's Act Two on some crazy, you know, on mushrooms or something like that. He gets a you know mauled by a bear and he runs away and he yeah. falls off a cliff. Uh, <laughs> exactly, it's like the guy cannot catch a break. Yeah, and I feel like right now we are living in the Revenant. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's a yeah. They say may you live in interesting times. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly interesting because it it has been one barrier after another, and and it's uh, I think people are ready for the barriers to be over and for us to get to the happy ending. 
I'll say. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to talk about the report, which uh, is really, really interesting and and so so apropos for the times. So we're going to take a quick break and be back with Andy Goodman of the Goodman Center. You're listening to Let's Hear It, a podcast about foundation and nonprofit communications hosted by Kirk Brown and Eric Brown. Let's Hear It is sponsored by the Communications Network, which connects, gathers, and informs the field of leaders working in communications for good. Because foundations and nonprofits that communicate well are stronger, smarter, and vastly more effective. You can find Let's Hear It online at letshearitcast.com or on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast. Thanks for listening, and now back to the show. Welcome back to Let's Hear It. We're, we're sitting here with Andy Goodman, the co founder and director of the Goodman Center, which is a virtual, well, among other things, you are a virtual school where do gooders learn to do better. I think is very Correct. clever and cute. Can you so let let's let's spend a little time talking about unmuted. Um, so this is a report you wrote. Unmuted: What works, what doesn't, and how we can all do better when working together online. Can you just? I, I mean, it's kind of obvious why you would do this, but what? Like, can you just talk a little bit about the the process of putting this report together? Sure. Um, th- this is this is actually a, a follow up to an earlier report. Uh, back in two thousand nine, we did an, a study then called, <laughs> let's see, dialing in, logging on, nodding off, the true costs of teleconferences, video conferences, and webinars. Because if you'll remember back to two thousand nine, we were coming off the recession of two thousand eight, and that's where we saw the first big uptick of organizations moving to online meetings, presentations, et cetera, because they were looking desperately for ways to save money. You know, budgets were way down. People were were really cutting budgets wherever they could. So in 2009, we saw this first big uptick and we said, um, well, this is worth studying because nonprofits are now and foundations are now doing this much more, much more video conferencing, et cetera. So we did the study back in 2009. And, and if you go back 11 years, uh, there were video conferences, but that's when really only uh, foundations and, and non- larger nonprofits had the sophisticated video conferencing equipment like you would see like in a conference room where there would be a big screen on one side of the room and a camera and then um, microphones on the table, you know, that type of video conferencing setup. Right. Um, and conference calls, which of course everyone was doing. And some people were just starting to do webinars. It was just starting to happen early on, there was no Zoom. I don't think there was, you know, uh, WebEx. I think there was just some, some of the earliest platforms out there. Anyway, we did that study in 2009. That started us down that path. Okay, so, and one of the things also in 2009, and we learned what some of the best practices are, we started to do a webinar at the Goodman Center called the Webinar on Webinars, where we teach you how to do better online presenting, training, meeting, et cetera. So that all happened in 2009. All right, fade out, fade in. It's now 2020 and it's 11 years later and we're still doing the webinar and webinars, but it has grown and changed over time as technology has changed. And then boom, COVID, March, 2020. And now all of a sudden everybody's closing up shop, going home, and now everything is happening online. Uh, all, you know, all business is being done online for everyone who can do it that way. So we made a decision in April 2020. We said, the webinar and webinars, it's valuable information. People need it. We're going to give it away for free. So we started to do it every Friday uh, as a free class. Sign up. Come, come take the class. We want you to have this information. You guys need this. You know, doesn't cost anything. Spend an hour with us. Learn how to do this better. And so we started to do that week in and week out. Some of it under the auspices of the Goodman Center and some of it partnering with other organizations who could assemble large audiences like the Chronicle of Philanthropy, like Communications Network, like CASE. And so we started to do it, hopefully so we could reach thousands of people with this information. And so while we were doing this week in and week out, we did it 30 times in April, May, and June. In the webinar, I would talk about this report we did back in 2009. And I kept referring to it and referring to it. And after a while, I was thinking to myself, you know, why am I referring to this data that's old enough to go to middle school? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, 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 you know, shouldn't we be updating this maybe? And so the idea kind of, you know, hatched in my brain that let's, let's do a new survey that asks 
more questions about the relevant technology and let's try this again. And so in July and August, we put, we said, we put out a new survey with the same philosophy as, as why bad presentations. Let's ask, let's ask the audience. Right. You, you tell us you're doing these video conferences. You tell us what works for you. What's driving you crazy. You know, we'll learn from the people who are doing it every day. So that was the inspiration for the research that we did in July and August. And ultimately that got us, 4,405 respondents from nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, colleges, and universities. I read the report, which is so interesting. And a lot of it is uh, stuff that I, I would say extends from the earlier work that you've done, that to give a good presentation, many yeah. of the principles about giving a good presentation apply when you're yes. doing a good you know, online presentation. Was there anything about this research that surprised you? Yeah, I'll tell you what the biggest surprise was. Going into the research, before we, before we designed the questionnaire, we, we interviewed some people, you know, like focus groups to kind of make sure we had in the right direction. And at first we thought that we could talk about video conferences in general, because we're all doing it, we're all having Zoom meetings, et cetera, et cetera. But people kept saying, well, if you're going to talk about this, you really need to divide it into categories because, you know, the rules that make a good Zoom meeting for 10 people would be different than the rules that make a good webinar for a hundred people or a good webcast that's reaching a thousand people at the same time. So going in, we thought, okay, we need to divide this up into categories and ask category specific questions if we're truly gonna learn what's going on out there. And that's ultimately what we did in our questionnaire. But when the results came back, what kept coming back to us again and again was, it kind of doesn't matter what you call it. The, the most important rules are all the same. Uh huh. And can you give us the, the, I don't know if it's the fatal five, it's the... The big takeaways? The big takeaways. Yeah, so the, the, the four biggest takeaways that we have in the executive summary that we say all, they, all, they all fall under four words, too much and not enough. Hmm. Um, too much is that people are saying video conferences, you know, whether it be it Zoom or Microsoft Teams or WebEx or whatever, uh, we're having too many. They're consuming too many hours of the day. I'm working at home. I don't need to be in five, six, or seven of these things a day, you know, four or five days a week. Everything doesn't need to be a Zoom call. It's like we forgot that the phone exists, right? One of the major complaints we heard was we're spending far too much time and that this is not the way work's going to get done. So too much time consumed by this. Second was that people didn't feel sufficiently engaged that the way that they were, the way that these things were executed, too many people are multitasking, too many people are feeling sort of left out or uninvolved. Uh, there's just not sufficient engagement. And, and that's both in terms of just being interested, but also doing things that foster a sense of inclusion or even address accessibility issues. Am I able to see it, to hear it, to understand it? Do I understand the language, et cetera? Are we, are we dealing properly dealing with people who come with any type of disabilities. Third, this might have been the most interesting to me, people felt there was not enough structure. That if you're going to take a part of my day, be it an hour or more, etc., I expect you to make good use of it. So I expect there to be a clear agenda. I expect there to be a clear progression. I expect that you for to lay out the rules of engagement for me. Structure became very important because stuck at home, People are now in these sort of isolated, distracted, unstructured environments. They actually crave structure. And the more you provide, the better. And then fourth and last of the big takeaways, not nearly enough training for the people who are leading and facilitating webinars, web meetings, whatever you want to call it. We're just basically throwing people in there and saying, okay, we're doing it online now. You know, knock yourself out. And there are things to be learned to be effective in this platform, in this, in this mode of communication. And people are not either organizations are not providing the training to their people or people are not providing or pursuing the training on their own. They're just kind of winging it, figuring like, you know, what's the big deal? You can see me, you can hear me. It's just like being in a room together. Just you get over it. But there's too much to get over. I, you know, it's interesting. One of the themes of, of what I've always learned from you, Andy, is that anybody can do anything a bit better if they just apply <laughs> For sure. a, a few principles. So, you, so you, not everyone has to be a graphic designer to use PowerPoint more effectively. Not everyone has to be, you know, Cicero or Mark Twain to tell a decent story. 
and yep. and you don't have to be I don't know what uh, some a McKinsey expert or something like that to to run a meeting. Uh, and actually, you also did a, a great session on meetings that I've I've learned a ton from too, which I also see kind of working its way into this into this work that you're doing now. And because a web meeting is nothing more than a running a meeting, except you're using these these different tools and you're you you're at even a greater deficit than you were if you were sitting there staring at somebody they they kind of it makes it harder for them to multitask but i think we all can admit that this is crazy right now how on earth are we going to get through this in my research on meetings i read a lot of the books out there about what makes a good meeting and one of the conclusions that i saw was in a book called mastering meetings put out by 3m was they said the single best predictor of a successful meeting is a well-prepared agenda. Hmm. And an agenda is not just a list of topics saying, okay, come to the meeting, it starts, it's in this room, it starts this time and we're gonna cover A, B, C, D. An agenda is almost like a miniature version of a strategic plan telling you where you're going, how you're gonna get there, who's gonna do the work and, and how we're gonna follow up. And that is doubly true for online meetings because just because of all the all the new elements we have of not being in the same room and, and the distractions we have at home, et cetera. So yeah, some of the things that I learned about that make meetings good in person absolutely carry over and even more so in the online environment. And people, I mean, this we've been in this for a while and needless to say, we're, we're talking about people who sit at a desk, who sit in an office, who do a lot of Zoom things. Um, there's a whole bunch of the workforce out there that are out in the field and or not as the case may be that that who have a completely different kind of experience but for for those of us who spend a lot of time in zoom we just hate it uh, i don't know if you saw yeah. if you saw jerry seinfeld's piece in the times i don't know a couple of months ago he he, he wrote an op-ed about how much we hate meetings and how we yeah. really want to go back to real life um, yes. So I, I didn't see that piece, but I've seen a lot of pieces like that. Yeah, it's pretty funny, uh, naturally. But given that, it, it also sounds to me like you are really up against it because people are, they, they're, they're cooped up. We're all stir crazy. We, and we have to sit in front of a screen for many, many, many hours a day. We don't want to be there. What would you say, uh, you know, are the one or two things that we can, again, like in your other areas, the things that anybody can do a little bit better that can keep people engaged in spite of the fact that we are all kind of really frustrated right now? Well, th there are certain things that in the report we refer to as the, the minimum daily adult requirements. And I don't know, someone told me that term might be archaic. <laughs> people might not relate to it. <laughs> um, to, my, to my mind, it's, it's the things that you absolutely have to do at the beginning uh, and in the framing of, of any type of online gathering. Going back to the issue of accessibility, um, if people, if anybody in your audience can't see or read what's on the screen, can't hear, has any trouble with language or translation, they're, they're lost completely. So making sure that what you have is completely accessible is in my mind, a minimum daily adult requirement. That, that, it's, a, it's like, you don't, you don't get past first base if you haven't done that. And by the way, big shout out to the communications network because I attended, as I'm sure you did, their the recent virtual conference, mm -hmm. you know, Communications Network V, they called it. Yep. And the platform that they designed was a model of accessibility because not only did they have uh, American Sign Language translators, you know, up on screen signing, you know, in a little corner while the person was speaking, but they also had uh, live real time transcriptions which also appeared on the screen, which you could change the, the font and the size of to make it as readable as possible. So they really went out of their way to make sure that the material was accessible, proving that you, that you just need to want to do it. Yeah. So that's accessibility. Inclusivity is, is just the, the act of, or the, the procedures of spending some time at the beginning of your meeting or your gathering, just the opening couple of, of minutes, acknowledging where people are, that they are at home, they might be distracted. It might be a crazy day. The thing that the news has been crazy lately, and people are coming in stressed out uh, and and feeling agitated about the state of the world, and giving them some space to either express that either through polls or chats or informal go rounds, but giving people some room to 
sort of decompress from whatever they were doing and enter your space and be welcomed and acknowledged and feel valued and included, and then you proceed. So things like uh, taking steps for accessibility and inclusivity, that's what I call minimum daily adult requirements to make sure everyone feels like they are welcome, they are valued, you know they're there, and you're not just talking at them. Well, in, in just the last couple of minutes that we have here, can you kind of paint the picture of an online meeting that works great? The you know either it's one you've attended or or the one that it exists in your in Andy yes. Goodman's dreams. <laughs> okay, well, okay, so it would start with with just what I've told you about the 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 platform itself, whether you use Zoom or WebEx or go or uh, Microsoft Teams or whatever, would be set up for accessibility so that. The slides, if there are any slides, they're designed in certain ways that, you know, high contrast, large fonts, et cetera. Everything has been designed to make it as readable, hearable, understandable as possible from the get-go. In the first couple of minutes, there are there's conversation or exercises or things that make everyone feel included, whether it's, you know, just informal conversation or quick polls, germane to the subject matter that give everyone a chance to sort of chime in and become part of the experience. And then once you get going, you're doing things to constantly keep people involved, whether it's you know, interactive things, you know, again, like more polls, using the chat, calling on people, having multiple speakers, things like that, things that keep it lively and moving back and forth. People are very easily distracted. It's even worse than, than in-person presentations when people are in a room and have to actually look at the front of the room and participate. Here Now they're at home. The temptation to look away is greater than ever. So what happens on screen has to be interesting, whether it's multiple people talking, slides changing, animations, videos. You have to put on a better show to keep people engaged throughout. And that show has to be well-structured, like we've talked about. People have to know what's coming up, exactly what's going to happen. How do I participate? Are the rules of engagement clear to me? And all of that should happen as concisely as possible because people get exhausted. So if you can do it in an hour or less, great. If it's gonna be more than an hour, then take substantial breaks, 10, 15, even 20 minutes between hours to give people a chance to get up, stretch their legs, get some fresh air, and then come back refreshed. I think if you do all of those things, chances are you'll have people more engaged, they'll participate, it'll be a more productive experience. Well, I, I'm so glad that you're doing this. Uh, I know it is desperately needed. You are, as I said, the Swiss Army knife of social sector communications. I think you should put that on your card. Okay. Uh, but Andy Goodman, the author of Unmuted, What Works, What Doesn't, and How We Can All Do Better When Working Together Online. You're the director of the Goodman Center at thegoodmancenter.com. Uh, it's just a pleasure. We've I've always wanted to have you on, Andy, and and now I've had I've had the great excuse to do it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And we're back. Oh my goodness, Mr. Brown. You know, I, I it's just it's it's the hits keep on coming. Now I have to say. <laughs> Everybody we've had on this podcast, there's gravitas, there's 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 excellence. Andy Goodman, I feel like, is really famous. Like I feel like Andy Goodman has just been doing this, you know, a good man. You know, he's just he's just been doing this work he is a good and man. and doing and 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 you know, it's funny, I'm I'm looking at his list of um resources over time, you know, why bad ads happen to good causes, why bad presentations happen to good causes, <laughs> storytelling is best practice, and then finally unmuted, what works, what doesn't, and how we can all do better better when working together online. So tell me the Genesis story, because, uh, you know, at one point, Andy had to come into foundations like the one you used to work at and say, hey, this is a leverage point. We have to create resources to address some of these challenges. How difficult was it to um, turn that wheel initially, would you say, for Andy <laughs> and his work? Well, Be <laughs> It's so interesting. Now, I know Andy since before I worked at the Hewlett Foundation. I was at the Center for a New American Dream, whose motto mm. was more fun, less stuff. And, we were, <laughs> and, and I met him then. And I let's see, I think he did Why Bad Ads 
oh, I bet ads happen to good causes. Anyway, mm. he was he was doing trainings for foundations and nonprofits way back then, and mm-hmm. and I became familiar with his work. At as I can't, I honestly can't remember this conversation, but he <laughs> used to work in television, and mm. he wrote for the nanny, and he was. Yeah. So he was <laughs> He was a joke writer for The Nanny. And okay, yep. little side story is that uh, Fran Drescher of The Nanny was uh, friends with my roommate when I lived in Hollywood. And so I used to see her in my living room. That's so funny. And she's <laughs> just like that. <laughs> so funny. She's very nice. Well, we were both from Queens, so, so we had lots in common. Anyway, Andy has been, he has taken what he has learned over the years and turned it into something really valuable for people who work in the nonprofit world. His, his, his workshops on storytelling have absolutely transformed the lives of nonprofit organizations everywhere. When I was at Hewlett, we would do an annual communications training conference, and Andy was, was invariably our keynote speaker, and he always we always had him in to do sessions on presentations and on storytelling. And it was transformative. I mean, it was just amazing. And for me, anyway, and I've seen his stuff many, 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 many times. And every time I see his his thing, I learn from him. So when he decided to take all of that stuff and pour it into how do we think about communicating better online, I thought, okay, this guy, A, he works very hard. Then B, he uh, understands what people need. Well, and he's funny. So this is what was so interesting hearing him talk with you. Um, his presentation as an interviewee is so different, I feel, <laughs> than his present his his right so you get the writer, you get the joke the joke teller. You, you know, he's so clever and so good at uh, coming up with this cut through language that helps you quickly understand what he's doing, what he's trying to get you to think about. But then when you hear him talk about it, I was thinking is Andy Goodman actually a communications engineer? Does he actually, is he actually able to deconstruct the system of thinking, the system of actions that are taking place when these things are going on and he could, he could pull them apart and then he, and then he, he breaks it down. Okay. What's missing. What's not working right. He gets the evidence. He assembles the right evidence and then he brings you back something that helps you wrap your arms around it. You know, and I, and I feel like that's what he's been doing with all of these different resources he's, he's been creating, you know, it's the presentation resource, you know, and, and even his, his process, um, it's never just Andy and his opinion. It seems like he's able to identify, Hey, we're all doing this. There are some clear challenges. Let's go out and interview, like, I don't know, 4,000 people or 2,000 people. And then let's come back with, I think just the model, the model he's perfected here. It's so good it's so necessary i mean wouldn't you agree it's just it's it's so clever okay i love how he does it a, i love how he if, does it if kirk if you are asking me if andy goodman is smarter than you or i the <laughs> yeah. answer is uh-huh no question <laughs> <laughs> because we just go out and say stuff he goes out and yeah. proves it and he knows yeah. he knows foundation executives and these fancy pants people well they want to see the evidence right they was like, okay, yeah. you tell me that I shouldn't read the slides. What? Yeah. <laughs> Give me some evidence. And so he goes out and he actually gathers that evidence. And if you tell me that I should change things up every 15 minutes, well, well show me the evidence. And he does that too. So he's smart mm-hmm. enough to know that he has to communicate to both sides of the brain and particularly mm-hmm. his audience, which is wants to do things the way they always did. When you tell somebody that they should do it differently – they want to know why that matters and why that's going to be effective. And he's smart enough to figure that out. I just say stuff and hope that people will listen to me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but Andy can actually show his work and that's what makes him so special. Well, and then the delivery part of this is so interesting because the training regimen from the Goodman center, it's both in person and online you know, storytelling, presentations, allowed, ethical storytelling, better meetings, the four connecting points. Oh, his meetings thing. We had him do these meetings, uh, workshops at Hewlett, at the San Francisco Foundation, a bunch of other places. And it's unbelievable because we actually run Mm -hmm. really, really cruddy meetings. I mean, I I say we, I mean, everyone on earth. The world. (laughs) The world runs bad meetings. And even that he understands how to do better. So- uh, 
hate to, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but it, go to the Goodman Center and just look at everything he, that he does. Most of his resources are available for free. You can download them. You can learn from them. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to have him in your in your organization when that happens again, do that. And if you can get him online, then that's great, too. But he is he is really a master. I wonder if how the dynamic has been working for him in terms of presenting new projects and getting them supported. Because, you know, in that discussion about how to do virtual better and how to do meetings better, this feeling comes up just of all these people working so earnestly, so hard, so full of expertise that they're trying to share and just not able to do it well. You know, they they have, they have this, this knowledge they're trying to impart and these key moments, these key ideas, here's a good idea for having a good meeting, have an agenda, <laughs> know what you're trying to say, know Gendish what you're trying to do. Agenda. And then, and then know what's agenda? supposed to happen after, but who has time for that? Right. Because so many people are so busy, you know, and of course, if you, if you don't make that time, then you're going to pay for it in so many different ways later. But it, it makes me think with Andy, and we've heard this a bunch, I feel like from different uh, conversations, this, the important space we need for reflection, you know, this, this need we, we have for those of us in our field who can step back a little bit, get a little bit, you know, disentangled from the ins and outs of the work each day and come back with these really great ideas for it. Hey, you know what? Have you thought about it this way? Can you do it that way? You, you know what I'm trying to say with that? I do. And, if I had to draw a line through uh, all of the things that Andy has taught me, it's that preparation is most of it. And mm. it's spring is here and it's time to start planting in the garden. And they always say you should plant a $1 plant in a $5 hole, which means, <laughs> which is that you dig the hole deep, you put a lot of fertilizer in it, you make sure that it's, it's ready to yeah. have your plant put in it. And I think that in almost everything we do, whether it's a prepara- whether it's a presentation, a meeting, uh, an event, a whatever, a strategy that you have to spend mm-hmm. way more time preparing than you actually spend doing. And to me, anyway, that is the theme that runs through everything that Andy has taught us, which is that if you're trying to communicate, you would tell a story that you have spent a lot of time thinking about and that you understand is going to be meaningful to your audience, or that you do a presentation that you have thought about what you're trying to achieve and who you're trying to communicate with, and that you you understand how people learn. And the preparation part is essential. And we don't do mm-hmm. nearly enough of that. We are all, many of us, maybe not you, but maybe me, once in a while, <laughs> flying by the seat of our pants, and we need to stop doing that. Oh, it's been known to happen from time to time. I know. Well, you know, I'm always interested. I'm always interested in the journeys people are making in this field, you know, where they come from, how they get here, what they're doing. Mr. Journey. And- Andy's journey, oh, okay. I feel like in some ways is the most oddly plausible because he comes from Hollywood. He comes yeah. from, you know, writing and, you know, he was in a, he was in an agency before that, but then it also struck me part of his, um, part of his process. And he talked about it on the interview though. It's not, it's not in his bio online, but he was with the, uh, environmental media association, right? right? That's correct. Uh, and, and just an interesting strategy there to leverage, you know, celebrity and people with a big platform to, and then <laughs> I love that idea of, you know, let's get some of these causes inserted into, you know, the Hollywood creative community. Right. So we're seeing this and kind of, and that's a really still an important idea, but back when they were first doing that, that was really, really big path breaking approach. But I think it's so interesting that the Goodman Center's work focuses on these cross-cutting tactics that are not specific to a particular domain, right? Sure. He's not talking about meetings for the education space right, right, right. or meetings for the environmental space. And I'm, I would be curious to hear him reflect on whether or not that's a, you know, th- that's a feature or a bug in the sense of, does it make it harder or easier for him to present his work? You know, if he's coming to a group of sort of domain or field focused people and he's saying, Hey, this is just going to apply to you. Cause this is good comp. This is, this is good sense for how to do this work better, but I'm not going to wrap it around the issue or the cause that you're thinking about. What do you think about that? Oh, Kirk, aren't you fun asking me whether I 
should have asked a question that I didn't ask. All right. Wait, no. Well no, done, I'm sir. Not, Way to sneak I'm that in. I'm not poking the bear. I'm that not poking the bear. That was a great interview, except for the questions not, you should have asked. All right. That's I'm okay. Not, I'm no. not offended. You're probably I'm not right. Friday. Well, I'm not proud. <laughs> But think about it. Sure. What a leveraged thing he's doing. I mean, th- th- these resources he creates useful for what? 10,000 organizations. I mean, oh, God. Uh, the there's steers- a million organizations out there. Well, right. Th- I mean, his notion, okay. I, I, we'll go around the, the horn here on all the things that he does, but his, <laughs> his work on storytelling to me is, is mm. transformative, which is that, you know, and I've said this on the show a trillion times, which is nobody crawls up onto their parents' lap at night and says, you know, mommy, daddy, tell me some statistics. <laughs> we we learn from storytelling. And I think that emanates yeah. from everything that he does. He's, he grew up as a storyteller. He cut his teeth as a storyteller. And he continues to be a storyteller, which is yeah. we communicate by making emotional connections to people. and And we have to make those emotional connections in every aspect of our work, whether it's a meeting or an online thing. And if we don't make those connections and have this time that we spend be valuable, then we are wasting valuable time. And there is no time to waste in any issue area that you're engaging in. As you say, if it, you can't just say that this is only applicable to one applicable to one aspect of our economy or our society or our social interests. It is mm-hmm. how human beings relate. They say things that are relevant to each other. We move them to action. We engage with their intellect and with their emotions. And that's how we make change. And you have to inspire people to want to do things differently because if they were doing things the right way in the first place, then we wouldn't need to be here. And that's what's so interesting about him and what he does. And he takes it and applies it to a million things. And Andy Goodman is just a, he's an amazing guy. I love him. So if you're a program officer sitting in a particular area within a foundation, should your first X amount of dollars just be parked for bringing this kind of capacity to bear to support all of your grantees? <laughs> You're like the setter in the volleyball game, and I'm going to spike it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If your grantees can't communicate, then why are you get like, why are they there? If they, if they can't move people, we're in the persuasion business. Like I just said, yeah. if people were going to do, if they did everything already the way we wanted them to do it, or they way our vision of the world was, then why? What are we doing? You know, yeah, you could shovel coal into the furnace to use a bad climate change, bad metaphor, but mm-hmm. you can make things that are already going go faster. That's one thing, but that's not what we do. We mm-hmm. are trying to move the. We're trying to bend stuff. We're trying to make folks go in a better direction than we're already going. Yeah. And that kind of persuasion requires communications and it requires the kinds of things that Andy and a lot of other wonderful people are focused on and he does it particularly well. And and this so this is the report that he's got out unmuted is a great example of that is how do we take advantage of this moment understanding that the tools that people are currently using are not being used as well as they need to be used. And that's what he's up to. Yeah. And I love the way how the leverage point he's exploring here is just stacking up, you know, because it's adding to field impact, but it's also saving people a lot of time in the process and liberating all of us from these horrible experiences we've all had where you're watching a PowerPoint presentation, but you're feeling the lifeblood, your soul literally sucked out of you as it goes on, or, you know, you're in that meeting setting and there's zero opportunities for interaction or engagement. Um, So fixing that part of it too, while you're also adding to impact, it just seems so great and so good and so needed. It's awesome. Well, Eric, is there anything else we need to say about uh, the Goodman center, Andy, his work, his team, and just all of the opportunities to, engage their content it's um it's terrific it's just so good yeah i would just say go ahead download unmuted what works what doesn't and how we can all do better when working together online like most if not all of his resources they're free i don't know my one my one critique of andy is he doesn't know how to make a buck 
<laughs> but he certainly had an impact. And you get the uh, sense that that's what gets him up in the morning. So, well, Andy Goodman, thank rich you for everything you do. That's all. <laughs> there you go. Andy Goodman, the Goodman Center. Uh, please go check out all of their work. And man, thank you so much, Andy, for coming on Let's Hear It. And Eric, thank you for bringing that conversation to us. It was just awesome. I live to serve. We'll see you next time. Let's hear it. And that's it for this episode. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about what you heard today or people we should have on the show. And that includes yourself. We'd like to thank Maggie Brown, our intrepid production coordinator. John Ali, the tuneful and inspiring composer of our theme music. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, the Communications Network, the Lumina Foundation, and the Heinz Endowments. Thank you, thank you. And check out the Heinz Endowment, their terrific podcast, We Can Be. That's hosted by Grant Oliphant, and you can find it at heinz.org slash podcast. We would certainly like to thank today's guest, and of course, all of you, and thank you, Mr. Brown? <laughs> no, no. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Till next time. Let's hear it.